All right, with the release of some of my new tools, I'm just going to go through uh, how you use them, I guess. So uh, here we go. So some of the new tools in here. One thing that I did update is I updated some of the easy grass settings. So I'll go through that uh, right now. You just drop that down. You'll see that we just get grass. Um, I'm going to make this a little more interesting real quick. And most of the time, you're going to be working on, on large-scale stuff with this because you're going to be working on environments and things. So the, the main difference here that I added is this world-scale multiplier. One of the big issues with the earlier versions of Easy Grass was that it was very inconsistent with the size of uh, the grass output. And that has a lot to do with the scale of whatever you're plugging into it. So uh, you can start scaling stuff up or down with this. So if I scale it down a little bit, it's going to make the grass bigger because we're saying with this scale multiplier, whatever scale this is at right now, I think it's at uh, 10 meters by 10 meters. We're saying with this multiplier, scale it down by 0 0.1. So this would now be 1 meter by 1 meter. If we do start amping it up, you'll see that we get more uh, grass in here. We can increase the amount. Uh, a lot of small stuff like that. All right, now I'm gonna move on to the next tool because that's, I think, the only edits I made to Easy Grass. So I go Easy. Let's go into the Easy Fracture because I made some edits to this. So if I drop down the pig head, and just so it's a little bit easier to see, I'll disable the shader. There's a few things that I changed in here. So for one, um, you have a whole new tab for chipping, and this is not the chipping that you might see on the RBD material fracture. This is uh, kind of my own workflow, and it's uh, it allows you to get these nice shapes without some of the weird artifacts that the RBD uh, material fracture gives you. So I'll do an exploded view, and uh, this is fine for here, but if I go over to this chipping tab and I enable it, it's easiest to work with this single piece pass first because uh, it doesn't actually fracture anything and it is, is very fast update. So you can kind of see what you're getting. And what we're looking at is we're looking at a single piece that's already been fractured and these red little bits, these are essentially the cutting bits for the chipping. And now we have a few controls on this chipping tab. I think the most important one of them is probably going to be this convexity mix midpoint, which you start bringing this down, that's essentially going to bring down, uh, here, I'll, I'll give it more um, chipper, <laughs> I guess you call these chipper geometries, I don't really know. Uh, but as you bring it up, basically this increases how sharp the angle has to be to cause chipping patterns. So you'll see it, that we're only getting uh, chipping on like these corners with real sharp edges. And now uh, if we start bringing this down, you'll see it starts spreading them out more across the edges here. And, and that's that's kind of what I liked for the chipping because I really just wanted the chipping along sharp uh, edges and stuff like that where you might get some chipping. You can control the scale of these cutters. You can control the amount up here. And then if I just I'll bring this back down to 55 just so I'm not killing this. I'm going to let go. Now you see we have all these little interesting chipping patterns. Um, I'll turn off the exploded view so you can see how these are kind of cutting. So now we have these interesting chipping pieces. Uh, one other thing that's new in here, I'll turn off the chipping, is we have this proxy geo. In this input, this third input here, you'll see proxy. And by default, it's going to look exactly the same because we're not using a proxy. We're just using the uh, input mesh. And what's going to happen if we plug this directly into the bullet solver is that for each of these pieces, it's going to try and make a convex hull out of it. And a lot of these pieces are very concave. So that's not going to work great. Um, what we want to do is we want to check this on. And you'll see this is probably something similar to what a bullet would, would make for our collisions by default. And now the lower we go with this, the more you'll see that we have those details in here. 
And it's going to get slower and slower to, to cook the lower you go, but it's going to get more and more accurate. All right. So there is that. And then what we can do with this is we can run this directly into the new easy RBD configure. So we'll go input there, oh, there, input there. Oop. <laughs> and there are actually some updates to this node as well. So uh, one of the main ones being uh, the create new constraints tab. So uh, one little issue, which I tried my best to fix with this chipping, is uh, setting up these constraints here. And that, it, it works. However, if you're going to do something like a soft constraint with these, uh, some of the naming conventions get a little messed up and it gets messy to look at inside of the, uh, one second. Sorry about that. Uh, it gets messy to look at inside of the bullet solver. So if instead in here you want to just create some new some new constraints, it gives you an option to do that. So you can go constraints, and currently we're just using the ones that output here. And now we can do create new constraints. And while it might not look like there's anything here, uh, it's because we're using hinge constraints, uh, which I find to be the best ones because they're. I don't know, they just seem to work a lot better for me. There, you can do some other modes in here, but I'd like this by default. Um, and so we got these new constraints, and now we can use all these uh, constraint properties. We also could build the collision proxy in here if we wanted to, instead of uh, up here. It doesn't really matter. So yeah, and then we just plug this into a RBD bullet solver. And I'll give it a ground plane just so you can see kind of what's happening. Zoom in just so you can see how everything's looking. Got all your little pieces flying around. Um, larger chunks staying together. So yeah, um, this is the new easy fracture uh, setups. Um, there's also a little bit a few changes inside of the poly repair, uh, but it's really no big deal. So yeah, so there's that. And uh, I'm gonna continue on to the next ones here in a second. All right, so next, uh, let's see, we got the easy groom. So easy groom is a little bit complicated, but it's not that bad. Um, it's actually super useful when you're doing animal fur, which is why I made it. So it's like a step-by-step -step process for creating uh, animal fur. And it's not for hair or anything like that, even though it's called Easy Groom. Um, I'm an idiot, so I should probably name these better. But anyways, uh, so we got these steps here. And this is the main, it's a basically, it's a step-by-step -step process uh, where you'll, once you're done with one thing, you'll go to the next. And uh, there's also a little how it works drop down and some other tabs here that'll help you. But these, this drop down is gonna be what you're using to jump from one thing to the next thing. Initially, this is just generating guides. So if I check this add mesh to output, you can see that it's just making these little guide guys on here. And that's probably fine for now. The main thing that we'd really do in this tab is just if we wanted to change the segments or if you had some sort of weird thing that you wanted to do. Um, and on this step, I will give it a little more guide density. On this step is where we want to jump into this node. It has a subnet in here. So if we double click, we'll jump in and we get this paint density and length attribute paint node. Now in here, I also have some of the instructions here for you if you forget again. So there's a no fur, a length, a width, and a density attribute. The no fur is just going to eliminate fur, uh, any fur uh, for both the guides and for both the, uh, the final. For so if we just paint this on, I might have to go to add here. So if we paint this on, you can see it's eliminating the fur around the areas. And this would be something you'd use mainly for like eyes, probably inside the mouth. Might get like inside his nose and stuff too. It's anywhere you might not want fur. And then you got options like length. So if I wanted to right now it's set to add. 
I actually, for length, I like to go to multiply, and I like to have it somewhere like maybe 1.5 and 0 0.5 is the foreground and background. That way, if you paint foreground and paint background, so if I left click to paint the foreground, you can see that it's gaining intensity in those areas. So I can make hair kind of shoot up. And if I go to the paint background here, I can make hair smaller. Uh, I want to smooth this a little bit. And I'll actually paint the background a little bit more here. So you can get real, um, kind of get a lot of control with just what areas you want to be long or short. And the same thing with width, although we're not visualizing that right now because I don't have open shaded curves on. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But density is uh, basically going to change the amount of fur that's generated in these areas. So I'll go add. You can see the more times we click, the more little furs we're getting. So this might be nice in areas where the fur is really small and has to be really dense for it to kind of uh, stand out or at least look realistic. So let's make some fur around his nose like that. Okay, and so once we're happy with what we've painted, we can, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna clear these. I'll, I'll clear painted fur weights, which is just a link to this reset down here. Let me redo these eyes and I think that's all I'm going to redo. All right, that's good. So now that we have that, we can move on to the next step. This uh, tab right here is basically only going to show what step you're on. And that's because it's just to make it idiot proof. I often found I would be trying to edit some of the like parameters in some other tab and be like, why isn't this working? And then realize I'm not on the correct step. Uh, so this step is where we start to paint the direction of the fur. So we can do uh, basically just in the viewport, we just start dragging along the mesh and we can paint multiple curves. Okay, that's fine now. Um, and then, so after that, you, you have a few other controls here. The surface lift is very important to push it off the skin. It's by default set to 0.1. Um, that should work most of the time, but if you're meshed, it depends on your mesh size. So if your mesh is really small, then that might be way too much. Or if your mesh is really big, that might be uh, not enough. And this voxel size is going to kind of contribute to that surface lift. Uh, so the lower you get here, the more kind of detail you can get out of both these curves and um, this surface lift. Okay, so... Uh, here isn't the only place you can change this uh, direction, so I'll, I'll just use this drop down up here, which is the same thing. So I'll go skin lift collide, and this is basically, this is really kind of the same thing that just happened where we're just uh, advecting the fur. You can push it out or do uh, some other things in here. I really don't do a ton in this tab, but it's, it is important sometimes. So uh, we'll skip to the next, and this is where we actually generate the fur. So I'm going to hide that input. Geo, and I'm also going to go up here and under MISC of the object level tab, you can check on shade open curves. You'll see basically the width, like the thickness of the curve. And you can see that here if I start turning up the thickness. And so in the final hair, mainly what you're doing here is changing the density of the, I didn't need to do that, um, so undo, but you're changing the density of the, the curve and the guided weights, and I guess the hair shape too. Uh, so the last tab is what we're going to be outputting, and that is the look tab. By default, it's going to give you just these kind of crazy colors um, here in this tab, and it's coloring it from the, the root of the fur to the tip of the fur. And then it's also going to be going in here and changing some of these lengths. So in a lot of animal fur, or really any fur in general, you're never going to have continuously the same length fur. So this set length here is basically just randomizing the scale of the fur a little bit to make sure that they're not all consistent. Then it's doing a little bit of clumping. You can change the clump size in here. And then you got uh, crossover rates, which is kind of how much the clumps bleed into each other. And then some clump shape stuff over here for clumping. You could do some curling if you wanted to. 
and then a lift at the end. And so one extra thing here is if you didn't want to use this, say you had a texture, and actually this guy does have a texture. So, okay, I got a path, and uh, I'll just show you what it looks like pasted in now. So now you can see that we're actually getting that color from this thing. Keep accidentally uh, <laughs> adding these curves. Also, if you accidentally add a curve or you want to remove a curve, you can go to this direction stroke and you'll see all the curves that you've the curves that you've drawn on here and you can select and you you can disable them if you don't want to completely delete them or you can just hit this X to delete them or you can hit clear strokes, which is also up here. And so one thing about this texture map is that it's applying it using vertex colors. And one big thing is that you can only get as much detail as the mesh has so like if this is really low res then we're only going to get colors from each of these points basically and what we want to do here is this subdivide allows you to just subdivide the mesh that's transferring these so you can get more and more uh, detail you can see this now looks a lot sharper i don't think there's enough I'll go up here on these guys i'll go fifteen thousand. And you can see there's a lot more, it's a lot clearer now than if this is off. Well, I guess it doesn't make too much of a difference for this guy, but for a very detailed mesh, you, you're definitely probably going to want this. Um, so uh, there's that. If, for example, you have like a mesh that comes with, like say you have a low resolution wolf that comes with the fur texture, it might be nice to apply this on, on there. And then that's, uh, that's pretty much done from here. Uh, you can go ahead and change some of the length settings. Maybe I do a multiply thickness, bring this thing down. And there you go. It's just pretty easy to uh, paint with this, uh, or at least get uh, a quick animal fur on something. And that's kind of the point of that. The uh, last thing I'll show is if your animal is animated or something like that, uh, then you'd want to do this whole thing at rest. So you'd like, probably want to do a time shift and then delete the channel so it's not animating, it just stays at one. And then whatever is animating, here I'll animate this a little bit so that it just moves forward like that. You wanna plug that into the second input. And that's gonna run through a deform. So you can see now that it follows this. You'll only see this update on the uh, fifth tab, like which is the final tab because that's where it gets applied. Just, uh, yeah, something to keep in mind there. If you have deforming or animated geometry, that's how you do it. And uh, yeah, so that's the easy groom node. All right, let's see what's next. Got, okay, we got easy attribute from camera. And for that, we're gonna need a camera and some type of geometry. So let me just make a camera real quick. And then I'll make, some geometry. Okay. So, jump into this. And I'll drop that the operation easy attribute from camera. Plug this in. And we have to connect our camera now. So now we'll connect the camera. And if I Go in here, it's going to generate this camera attribute. And you'll see that it's giving us an attribute. Uh, what's in front of the camera and then what's behind the camera. You can kind of see that now. And you have a few controllers here. The blurring iteration is basically going to, because it's very obviously with zero, it's, it's very kind of scattershot. You really only need a few most of the time, but by default, I think I set it to 50 just to be safe. And then there's the ramp cutoff, which is going to, you can see here, add uh, and kind of take away the harshness of that look. You also have a distance from cam attribute. So if I disable that and I turn on the, oh, if I enable that and I turn off the, or which one, <laughs> which one's showing, sorry. So if I turn on cam distance, you can now see that we're getting this uh, 
cam this distance from camera. It's basically just going to tell you the farthest points away and the closest. If I do a geometry spreadsheet just so we can look at these attributes. Cam disk from camera. So cam disk is going to be the distance from camera attribute, and one is going to be the farthest, zero is going to be the closest. And then cam is just going to be typically kind of a there is a little bit of a fall off, I guess, but um it's just gonna be that uh what's hidden and what's not. One last thing you can do here is you can actually bring in if I go to that rubber toy. And I'll include this hotkey also, which is very nice to just control shift V, uh, merge stuff in. If I have this, it's behind this, so it's still not visible. So it would make sense for the camera attribute to uh, make up for what's not visible here. So if I plug this in, you'll see now that it's like a it kind of like projects a shadow so you can hide uh things behind it with this attribute and that's i think the gist of it i guess you can change the frame that this camera is projecting from change the name of the camera attribute and all that stuff but uh but yeah um that's the gist of this one i'll move on to whatever is next this I hate this. It's easy attribute from point number. So we plug this guy in, and all it's doing is just giving us an attribute from the point number. So the highest point number is going to be one, lowest point number is going to be zero. You can do some sort operations in here. So uh, if I sort by y, it's going to sort the points from top to bottom, and then it's going to apply this attribute, and then it's going to. Uh, and then it's going to reapply the original point numbers, so you're not going to lose those point numbers still. But uh, if I plug this in, for example, just to show you, it outputs a attribute called range. And now you can see we're getting black at the bottom here and white near the top. You can do by x. You can see now we're getting left to right. Uh, by z, you can do just a shift random uh, spatial locality. Proximity to point. Uh, lots of stuff you can do here. So, I mean, that's just kind of the just, I guess there was actually a visualized color <laughs> here already. But um, remaps, all that good stuff. So, that's this node. Let's move on to the next one. This thing. So, tribute mix. I don't know if I cover this one, so I'll cover real quick. This is not new to the new pack, but uh, it's just uh, one I use very often. So, I'll give this thing a color. And I'll give this guy a color. Make this one something like that. And this one something like that. I'll make it blue just so it stands out more. Okay, so now if we plugged the two of these in, and say I actually I use that, that attribute from point number. So I plug that guy in, and I go sort operation, I do by Y. And now I want to blend in the color of this thing. I want to blend it in using that attribute range that I just made. So uh, I'll do this is what type of attribute. So we're going to blend CD and it is a vector three. So that's what we're going to blend with. And then uh, the blend with, I mean, that, that's what we're going to blend between. And then the blend with is what we're going to blend with. So that is called range. Now you can see that we're blending between the two of those. We can remap this as well from here and you can do all sorts of things with this you can do uh, if you didn't want to do b you could do uh, p here and i'll transform this guy up a little bit or maybe even push him, push him in like that and now you can see that we're using that range attribute if i change this to by z by x and this can be any attribute um, we're using that to blend between them. The swap inputs is just going to swap the way they're blending, basically. So you'd go from this one to this one instead of from input one to input two down here. And yeah, so that's the easy attribute mix. Let's keep going. 
So easy clean is a simple. One thing about the clean SOP is that you might get a lot of errors with things depending on what scale you're working at. Because if you're working at a very small scale, the clean SOP actually does, it uses like distance based things. Like if it uses fusing and it uses uh, basically distance based lengths to tell it what polygons and like what kind of points are overlapping or on top of each other and, and stuff like that. And so if you're working on a really small scale, like I have been in some other projects, this basically all it re all it really is, is is a match size into a clean and then into a match size again that pulls it back down to what it was and then it just deletes that match size tribute and pulls in any match size x forms that you might have had already so uh pretty simple you control the snap scale here and uh that's the gist of this guy and this is at 16 million points right now 16 million primitives so we're gonna bring this down a good chunk. So let's make a camera first. I'm gonna delete this camera I was using earlier. Let's find a shot that we might like. So maybe something like, I don't know, some landscape shot like this. So I'll make a camera here. And there's my camera. So uh, let's go over a few of the new tools that uh, are in the Easy Pack. So. The biggest new tool in the optimization tab is probably the, I'll go to optimization. So I have all the, leg, I'll call them legacy uh, nodes still, because some of them work nice, uh, work nice for like animation. That is the one thing I'm still working on for this camera clip node is the, uh, having it be able to work over animation like the, ca uh, the camera crop and the optimize can. So we're gonna drop down this easy camera crop. And really where this thing actually excels, which maybe I should have showed, is uh, with something lower res. In fact, I'll actually sh I'll show that too real quick. So if I have a grid, this is a, the issue I was running into with the optimize, which is why I made this node. So if I have a grid and I go make another camera down here. Okay. And I use, on this camera, I use the easy camera clip, that uh, easy camera crop that exists right now. Uh, you can use this animation, which is nice, which is why I kept it. But you'll see, for lower res stuff, you're blasting out entire points and polys. So it's not clean here. You're not, even if you wanted to hug the side of it, it's, it's not clean. The camera clip works uh, basically by clipping it. So if I bring this camera in, you can now see that it actually actually clips the geometry. So you can really get right in on those edges. Um, and yeah, so, and then there's a few other things that I'll show here on this heavier geometry. So I'm gonna put the camera in first so it doesn't spaz out on me. And I'll plug this in and it's gonna clip out the camera Geometry that's not in view first. Because we don't need all of that geometry that's not, uh, that we're not even seeing. It's just a waste of space. Okay, it took like probably 30 seconds. So for this, that already brings it down from 16 uh, million points to 5 million points. It's already a huge uh, difference because we don't need all the extra stuff. Now, basically we have a hidden decimate, which is going to decimate anything that's hidden from view. Now in this decimate path, uh, we can either output an attribute, which is what it's doing right now. Visible, do it again, visible. Okay, so now you see this really nice uh, visibility attribute that we have. So you can do that, um, R on this. You can also just go ahead and you can blast it out. Just gonna cut holes and everything. You might not want that because you might need this thing to be full. Or you can do a poly reduce. So I'll bring it down to eight. You can actually, you can go crazy with this thing because, I mean, you're not seeing these polygons anyways. You can see we have super decimated polys. You actually might see a little bit here. So let me bring this up. I'm not going to bother with that. This is fine, honestly. Uh, So 3,482,000 already. You can also make sure that this thing is full. So in certain cases, say this thing already had, it already had like a base to it and everything. And it's, it's, it's full. It's an actual, like it's all the polygons are connected. There's no open 
faces. Um, you might need something like that if you're going to do subsurface scattering on things. Like I know, for example, Redshift needs, uh, if you're going to do subsurface scattering, at least it wants the mesh to be enclosed so it can actually get a depth attribute. And for stuff like that, uh, there is this polyfill up here. And by default, this is the issue. We'll see what this looks like. Actually, I'll, I'll turn off this um, decimate. So this is the issue you're going to get when you polyfill things for most of the time. Um, so it's taking these edges right here, and it's going to try and launch them straight through the mesh. So that uh, doesn't really work most of the time. It is an option on this polyfill uh, setup, but it <laughs> kind of sucks. And you, I don't know what you might need it for, but it's there if you need it. The best one is this fractured box fill, but it does take the longest since it uses Boolean. And then this ray fill is kind of a little bit of in between, but uh, it does require you to, to choose a direction in which it's going to ray to. So uh, let's try this fractured box fill real quick. Okay, so I'll, I'll clip something like this. I'll run this clip. So this is the unfilled mode that it's clipping out. And now I'll run the fractured box fill. All right, so it just finished. And uh, what you can see is you can see that we still have the view unobstructed, and we have the entire mesh filled now with a kind of box-like mesh that goes around the corners of everything. Okay, but we don't really want this. So I'm just going to go polyfill none. I'm actually going to go back to our first view, and then I'm going to start using some other nodes. All right, so I chose this camera angle here. And then I decided I'm just going to blast out stuff that I don't want. So we got this down to 3 million uh, points for this shot without really taking out any of the resolution here. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, cache this. So I'm actually going to use one of the other nodes that's in this pack, Easy Stash. And this node is really just a stash node. Um, but it's a stash node that gives a very specific path. So it's going to give you a specific path for everything. Um, even including the geopath so that everything kind of stays the same. And it's not like the stash node. It comes with Houdini because the stash node is going to cache your geometry to the hit file itself. And this, uh, I don't even know if I want to show you <laughs> this example, but let's just do it. So I'll stash this here. And this is stash the node. Now if I save this hit file, save it. Follow this stash. You'll see that the because it's saving this geometry to the hip file, the hip file gets huge, and you can see how long it's taking to save this file. And that gets really, really annoying um, when you're kind of working with stuff. And I like to a lot of time just have one button on the stash node that allows me to. Uh, so you'll see now this is a 360 megabyte hip file. It's going to take probably 40 seconds every time I want to save this thing. So I'm going to delete this, and I really just want some sort of node that lets me just uh, click a button, and then it's going to save the geometry to whatever this thing is named um, inside of a specific folder uh, that's related to the hit file. So after this stash gets deleted, I'll just do it here, and all you really got to do is just hit call this uh, mountain hit stash. Gonna save the geometry and I'll hit save and you can see how fast that saved. And now you'll see that there's this hit file is only 484 kilobytes. And we have this stash folder in here uh, with the big old path that leads to this geometry now. Okay, so uh, let's keep going from here. Next, let's do the easy copy to points that I was talking about. Okay, so I have these tree geometries now. I'll go ahead and I'll just take a look at these. I just gave them some really basic colors. Um, they're nothing, they're, they're pretty terrible, so don't judge them. But uh, we're just going to show you kind of how you'd use this easy copy points. So I'll go ahead and I'll drop in easy copy to points. And the input is basically just a merge. So we can grab all of these guys and plug all these in. And the nice thing about this is it's going to automatically make variations for each of them. And by default, uh, when we don't have anything plugged in here, it's this mesh. 
uh, slot. It's just going to scatter um, everything onto a grid by default. So if I take the mountain and I plug it into this mesh, you can see that we're scattering on the mountain now. And just so we can see things, I'm going to take these two outputs. The second output is the source mesh. Um, this is the source scatter points if you wanted just the points. And then the instance vari variations are coming out of this uh, output. Uh, we have the input geometry, which if we wanted to, but by default it rotates at uh, 90 degrees because this is kind of for trees and stuff. So, um, or it's not meant for trees, but I mean, that's, that's kind of why I made it. It's just for easy scattering geometry across terrains. And most of the time you probably are working on your trees facing up and then you kind of forget to rotate them because they have to be facing down the uh, Z axis. And the main tab that you're going to be working with is this scatter manipulation tab. And you can see, if I uncheck everything, uh, we'll have no tabs here. So the more we uh, check on here, the more uh, controls we have. I also hope that didn't just crash this because, oh, okay, there we go. All right, so let's, uh, so scatter is, should be on always, honestly, unless you want to use the points from the mesh. And it's just your scatter node. Nothing crazy about it. So orient is going to give these random orientations. And uh, you can do that based off of a noise, or you can do that just randomly. Uh, and you can change all these directions and all that stuff. If you do a noise, then uh, you can also check this constant n, which this is going to make sure things are pointed upright, which is how like you, you get trees and stuff. So if this is off, it's going to you'll see down here, basically use the normals that it's copying to, to tell it the direction. Um, and trees don't really grow outwards on the side of cliffs and stuff. <laughs> like trees don't grow this way. I mean, maybe they do, but uh, not typically. So constant N is basically just gonna keep them putting, pointing up. And so then you get your P scale. I'm just gonna randomize the P scale. Uh, you can do things like change the Accuracy down here. I don't think I ever want this to be this low. So I'll go 0.1. Then you have also the remove point threshold. So if I just go one here, two here. If I bring this up, you'll start seeing that it's going to start clipping out trees that are under that threshold. I'm also going to just give this more scatter points. Now that we got those two tabs, um, you also can do uh, a noise influence if you wanted to. Set this to add. Set this a lot lower. Okay. And now we start getting into the, some of the more, some of the reasons why I actually made this note, because there's a billion different copy to points, HDAs out there. So uh, first we have the height influence, which is going to change the density based off of height. So you can see now that we're getting a lot more scattered points down at the base of this thing and i'll bring this back down to one okay so now you're seeing that we're getting a lot more points at the base whereas the higher we go on this mesh the more it chops off and this is not a actual height based operation it's the local height so it's a zero to one from the lowest point on this mesh to the highest point so it doesn't matter if your mesh is five thousand feet tall or if it's three feet tall this is going to be a ramp from bottom to top and I can simply just switch this around if I wanted most of the scatter points on the top. I don't think I want that though. So I'll go ahead and I'll check this off for now. And next tab is the camera influence. And you'll see if we check that on, it's gonna bring in the camera influence tab. And so in this tab, we have to select our camera, select camera one. And right off the bat, uh, since we already did a lot of kind of removing the geometry that's not in view, this doesn't really do a ton. By default, it would start removing points like in the areas that we already have removed. But since we already have them removed, it's not doing a ton there. But you can check on this distance influence. And that's going to either decrease or increase the amount of points scattered based off of the distance from camera. And now you'll see that we got a lot more of these trees up close by the camera. And then they start to taper off 
uh, the farther away they get. You can do the inverse of this if you want. So now we got a bunch of trees back here on this cliff and we don't have many uh, in the front. So that can be a nice way to uh, kind of scatter and optimize your scattered points in geometry. Check this off. So now we have this curvature influence. Now check that on. So here we go. And so this is going to give us, so we have the option to multiply, add, or subtract the curvature data that we're outputting with our density. You'll see by default, it's set up so that it is kind of multiplying out areas that are, are very high in curvature. So we don't really get as many points our scattered trees along like really steep edges in, in areas like that. Okay, so that's the curvature. This is just a noise here. So this is density noise. It's just going to kind of give you little noise clumps. And you can change the scale size. One thing about the density noise, though, is it scales the whole your whole source mesh down, brings it down, and then applies the noise, and then brings it back up. That's why uh, this element size is 0 0.05, and it still works. So that's, that's just so that we're always working with a consistent size mesh and consistent size noises, uh, no matter how big or how small your mesh is. So it's just an easy way to just throw that on. We have texture displacement. If we had a texture map for this, which we don't, um, we could basically displace the mesh, and then uh, the trees would be copied to the displaced mesh. We have an offset, which uh, allows us to push the trees off of the surface or into the surface. So we could go in. And this, uh, this parameter is set up to be very... Uh, light so you can see we're only going i think it maxes out at 0.1 and then mins out at negative 0.1 you can go lower and obviously that's not actually clamping anything but just so it's kind of easy to move around i made it pretty pretty tight okay then you can uh, do all the output attributes that you get from a, a scatter and uh yeah so that's how you would use the easy copy to points these outputs are, if I wasn't merging these together, you'd see that we have the trees here that are instanced. We have on the second input, the mesh. So if in here you're doing something to it, like you are adding noises and you're adding a texture displacement and stuff like that, uh, you're gonna get those attributes out here. And then you have a source scatter, which these are bringing in your scattered uh, points if you wanted to do this separately for something. Okay, so that's the uh, easy copy to points. Let's keep moving on. So now let's go over the easy detangle. Now the easy detangle, basically, say I have a box. I'll subdivide it a bunch. Like this. Five, something like that. And let's say, uh, yeah, just let's work with that for right now. So one thing you could do in here is the enable self collision. So this is works well for something like if you have a bunch of strands of hair or you have a bunch of tubes or things like that that are kind of running over each other that you might want the self collisions on. I'm going to turn that off because we're not really working with that. And let's create another box. And I'll just kind of take this one. And let's move it like that. Scale it out. And like that, something like that. Okay, so if we plug that box into the second input, uh, yeah, we get some terrible looking stuff. And that has a lot to do with how this automatic mode is working. Uh, essentially, this is trying <laughs> to uh, trying to push the geometry back to where uh, it's trying to basically, I guess, detangle using this collision. Um, I'll explain here better just using this uh, setup. So on the advanced tab, we have this uh, subnet enable options. And I'll check on the, we have self collisions and we have uh, collision reference. And the collision reference is what we're going to want to use because that's the second input. So we'll use use internal subnet. And then if we double click here, we have the self collisions and we have the collisions from input. And the goal of this 
what we want to do here is we want to get this box into a position where it's not uh, intersecting with the original box, like this, the, the base box. And maybe the best way to think of this is we're trying to set up where we want it to come from. So we want it to come from this position and end up at the position that's in. And if you see now, we get this nice little setting here. Maybe I turn off the pin borders. And we can crank up some of the iterations. We can also change the thickness here so we can go like five, one to get a little bit of a kind of more nice uh, blend here. You can blend the effect in or out. And so, yeah, so when you use the internal collision stuff, or I mean these. Uh, collision subnetworks, the whole idea is that you just want to basically get in a position that isn't intersecting and that is basically you want it to come from the position that you're changing it to to the position that ends up in. Uh, like so, for example, if I pulled this guy over here, now see that it basically is coming from that position and pushing the geometry over here. All right, so that's cool. Uh, let's go ahead. And uh, same thing if you were doing self-intersecting geometry. You basically want to make sure that they're not intersected, and then uh, and then you'd run the whole thing. But okay, so uh, that's the gist of the easy detangle. Okay, so I just laid these out here now. Um, so next up is the easy group by name. This one is pretty simple. It's just going to create groups based off of the name of something. So if I have this fractured pig head, and on it, there's this name attribute here, and there's 31 unique names of it. So there is a name uh, from groups node, and there's a name node, uh, and I have not seen, I don't know, I could be just stupid, <laughs> but I have not seen a group by name. And you really don't have to use the name attribute. You can use kind of whatever you want here. But uh, so a lot in a lot of cases, you can use the name attribute uh, as an expression or the selection just in general, but uh, not always. And it can just be nice to have it. So basically, all this does is it just creates a group uh, based on whatever your name is. So you have your piece zero, piece zero, um, all the way to piece 30. And it's going to change that. So. Uh, so yeah, so that's pretty simple there. It's a simple one. There's the easy match axis. So I'll actually, this one's a little bit more complicated. I don't think people know what this does. I use this a lot actually, but it's a little just confusing. So let's say I have a box here or some something something that at least has a flat edge on it that's off its axis. And I have, I have no idea what this rotate is. I am totally clueless. If I wanted to line this up, I would have to do something like uh, transform this and just kind of try and get this thing lined up again. However, if I wanted this to be perfectly lined up on axes, I could use this match axis node. And what it does is you have this operation type up here. And by default, it's selected uh, start and selected end. So this would work if we have two inputs. Uh, since we're just going to use the one input for now, I'll change this to selected start and vector destination. And now, we can select the polygon side that we want to line up with this end vector. So we, I'm going to select top because it's going to uh, line up by default to the up vector. And now you can see that the polygon all of a sudden is lined up. If you want to do this operation at center, it's basically going to... Uh, match size it, do the operation, and then bring it back. Uh, so now, often you need to do two of these in a row to get uh, an object fully aligned back to normal. So I'll go grab this side now, and I'm going to go end vector here. Now you see we have our box back to normal. Now we could also check off this do operation center. If I have a box that's just normal, I could plug this box in here. I could go uh, box here, and I'll go selected start, selected end. I 
think I did four. And since I know these are the same, actually, I'll do four and four. So yeah, so four and four here, and then I'll grab this again. And let's line up this side with this side. And now we've taken this box and brought it back to its original location. Okay. Now we got this easy merge node, which um, not much difficult about a merge node, but I always thought, so let's say you have a bunch of stuff. You got Pighead, you got this ragdoll thing. Oh, no, that's okay. Let's do just geometry, just squab, got a template body. Just a bunch of weird stuff right now. And we got Tommy. Let's say you have a ton of this stuff. So you have a bunch of crap here. Line these up. And you merge these together. Now, I mean, that's great and all, but if you wanted to run, like, say, a for each loop over this kind of stuff, you're going to have some problems with meshes that aren't all one piece. So this might work if everything in here was just a single piece, but like, for example, I know for a fact, Tommy, if I do a for each piece, all these, do single pass, start browsing through these, you'll start seeing that there's no way to really separate these perfectly without going through and uh, doing either a create attribute or a, like a pack between each of these. And that's just annoying <laughs> as hell. So uh, I'm going to grab all of these. I'm going to plug these into the EG merge. And what the easy merge does is it creates an index attribute. So you'll now see this primitive merge index. And you can see that we have 16 of them. So if I do uh, for each name primitive and I set that to merge index, yep. So now we can do a for each loop over each of these. And there's actually inside of here, if you do a loop dive net. You can actually jump in and run the forage loop already inside of here. So there is one preset up for you. Um, you can do things like uh, pack individually. So you can pack each of the merges. And you can do whatever you want to each of them in here already. So say I want to, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do in here, uh, but you, you get the gist of it. So that is the easy merge. Let's keep it going. So next is the easy crease smooth, which is basically if I take some stuff, say I take a pig head and that's geometry rubber toy. And I merge these things together. And I translate this guy maybe down a little bit and over. Maybe I rotate them. So if I wanted these guys to merge together, I didn't want to use a Boolean and I didn't want to use a VDB version because I want them to keep their UVs perfect how they are. But I did want to blend this edge, this crease here, and I wanted them to be one uh, connected object. You can do that with the crease smooth, which is really, you can plug in whatever you want in here. And if I turn off this, you'll see that these guys are now one mesh. And in here, you can increase the blurring iterations. You can increase the crease step size. You can do a subdivide. I'll run two of them. So now you have this nice little crease, and the UVs are cut along the edge perfectly. <laughs> I and mean, they don't look great right here, but uh, if I turn this off. Uh, they they're not changing. They're not deforming. They're not creating any weird artifacts or anything like that. So. That's the gist of that. So if I can do a bunch of these if I wanted to. It's really anything you merge together. And this thing can actually handle a surprising amount of geometry. So you just have to merge it above and then pull it in. And it'll it'll do its thing. And yeah, so that's the easy uh, tree smooth. Okay, so next we're going to take a look at the easy normal. If I pull this over. I think this is going to uh, show best on a circle. So we'll create a circle. I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll plug that in. Okay, so uh, by default, 
uh, if it doesn't have normals, it's going to give you uh, a few. So we have a few different things going on here. We have this input normal, which is going to generate a type of normal for us. So if we do input normal, it's going to pull through from whatever we already have here. If we do point normal, it's going to generate point normals, which is what it, what it already kind of did because uh, we didn't have any normals to begin with. So uh, you're not really seeing any change there. Then we have tangent normals which are going to pull in the, uh, it's a polyframe with uh, the tangent set to actually be the normal. So you can actually change the style of this. You can do first edge, which if we zoom in, you can see is pulling the normals there, uh, kind of around the curve. You can do two edges, which is going to use two edges, and that ends up pointing inwards. Then there's primitive center, uh, centroid, which doesn't really change much here since our circle is perfect. But, uh, we can also change to bitangent, which is going to give us some different looks here. Um, and we can mess around with tangent style if we want. Two edges is usually fine. Um, switching between these two will get you similar uh, looks. But down here, we also have this invert uh, output normals. If you want to kind of just change the direction these things are going. Then we have, lastly, a manual constant. So we can just input a just directly override all normals if we want to. Carrying on from that, I'm going to uh, change this to, I'll change this to tangent normals. Uh, you might be wondering what this tab down here is and why this guy's grayed out. So this is the math operation. Currently, it's set the pass through, so it's not using this operation input at all. If we set it to cross product, then what this is going to do, basically, you can think of this whole tab as input one and this whole tab is input two and they're going into a math operation together so if we have it so let's say manual constant zero one and we do a cross product with a manual constant zero one here this is what we end up getting it's nothing crazy but uh basically save you the hassle of setting up a cross product. We also have a reflection here. We have a refraction. We can change the, I'll do the tangent here just so we can see some different kind of weird things going on. So that's a refraction, reflection, we can do a dot product, and we can do the average. So right now we're averaging between the manual constant and the tangent normal of our operation. What we could also do before this operation here is this pre-operation. So we are creating, we're pulling a normal type from these input uh, inputs here, and then we can run a pre-operation. So I can get the cosine of the manual constant or the tangent or the complement of it. Uh, we could do absolutes, normalize it. We could just invert it here if we want. So, I mean, there are lots of things we could do here. Uh, I'll go ahead and I'll just leave this to pass through. Same thing on here. And then uh, lastly here, we can use this post operation. So I'll, I'll do a bitangent. Let's can do a reflection based off of, we'll just do something weird. Okay, so that's that's a weird looking thing. <laughs> and if we wanted to, we could uh, use this post operation, which the post operation is the last thing that happens in all this uh, this chain. So it uh, pulls the input and then it applies this pre operation. It pulls this input and it applies this pre operation, takes both of these and runs them using one of these. Uh, math operations. Then after that, you have a little bit more control so you can run this post operation. So you have the option to normalize, get an absolute value out of it, you can invert it, which is kind of the same thing as what's going on here. But And then uh, one of the cool things you can do here is you can mix it actually. So you can mix it back in with, right now we're mixing it with the input normal these naming configurations are a little confusing, but uh, the input normal is actually this whole thing. 
uh, or at least this this tab right here. It's not running the pre-operation yet. So if you do pre-operation input normal, then it's running both of these. So like if we did cosine, so you see now we're we're applying that cosine once we switch to this. And then um, you can do from node input, which is gonna basically just pull in and mix, allow you to mix in with what the node had coming in. Do point normal, which is gonna be the same thing that we're gonna see. Do a by tangent or tangent and by tangent here as well. One other cool thing you can do is you can, instead of using this mix knob, you can actually use an attribute. So for this, I'm gonna create an attribute from point number. And since these are actually numbered around, that actually might be kind of cool. So by default, it's gonna try and use an attribute called mask, but we can just tell it to use range. And now you see that uh, at point zero, it's uh, fully mixed with, uh, or I guess might be, might be backwards, but uh, you can see how 75 is the tangent and then it pulls it all the way around. And now if we take this ramp, we can actually remap uh, what's happening here. So we can maybe these down. There's some fun stuff you can do with this. Uh, just, um, I mean, this isn't anything special, but this is, I'm just trying to show you how you could use this. And then um, after that, uh, we have this advanced tab. And in here, you can normalize the normals coming out of here. You can multiply them, so you can add power to them, or you can uh, negate them like that. Uh, this multiply strength won't work with the normalized set, but uh, here if we turn it off, we can also do this next little step, which is my favorite, uh, or not my favorite, but one of my most used features in here is this transform via normal. And this is going to push the points in the normal direction. We can even use this multiply strength to blend it around. And then once you're done with all that, you can you, you can recalculate the normals if you want. You can reapply the normals from the input. Or uh, you can normalize them. You, I mean, you can do all sorts of stuff. Uh, but this is just a nice little node to make a lot of these operations easy. It really is just running a point bop in here with a lot of different uh, cross products, reflections, and uh, math operations going on that really would just kind of be annoying to have to set up time and time again. And it's just an easy way to quickly apply a bunch of them. So uh, well, let's move on to the next one. Now let's take a look at the easy normalize. And this is just going to take any vector attribute and normalize it. So if I do, let's just create grid. And let's we randomize, just do something like a color, sure, why not? And let's make this something crazy. And if I plug this in and I do attribute to normalize, I do color, you'll see that previously we were getting color ranges way higher than just zero to one, and sometimes even negative. And if we go normalize, and you'll see we're all within the zero to one range. So that is the easy normalized node. Then we have this easy not a Boolean, which the easy not a Boolean is not a Boolean. It is uh, a way, if you just wanted to kind of blast some stuff out, so like this pig head, let's say I have a sphere, run the easy not a Boolean, it's going to kind of group some points based off of where this thing is. 
It's not going to boolean at all. It's just going to delete uh, geometry. So sometimes you might not want to have a boolean because it can create it can create bad polygons and and n gons <laughs> and n gons and things like that. Uh, not always uh, the best. You have a few different controls here. So delete non-selected. You can delete it based off of a distance attribute. Um, some smoothing operations. And uh, yeah, that's that's the easy not a boolean. Next, we're going to do one of my more favorite ones. <laughs> so there is the easy object merge. And I'm going to go ahead for this and drop down some test geometry at the object level. So we jump into a geo node. Typically, with a object merge, what we'd have to do is go ahead and start. Um, well, first off, I'll, I'll show you <laughs> what this fixes. So if we wanted to grab a bunch of objects, We'd grab a grid, then we have to hit this plus, then we grab the pickhead, then we have to hit this plus, and then we grab the squab, and then we'd also have to say into this um, object to get them in here. And that just takes a lot of time if you have a ton of stuff. The object merge, um, the easy object merge, uses a path list instead for one. I'll hide these. And now you can select multiple stuff just by holding control and now we can bring all that in at once now that's easy enough as itself but there's actually also a little python script i uh, set up with it and uh, we have the ability to import all visible nodes so if we hit visible nodes then all of a sudden you'll see that we have everything that's visible here if i start turning so i make this visible and I start turning off some of these say I just have the grid the test geometry and the squab and I refresh this you'll see that's what it's going to bring in and also have this layout option which is going to lay out the geometry in either x y or z I forgot that I rotated that grid <laughs> that's confusing me but and then we can also pack the geometry on input we can pack by connectivity uh, we can pack by name. None of these have names, so I don't want to do that. But uh, there's also, we can delete attributes. We can delete groups on its way in. And if we wanted to switch back to the manual mode and have these options, all we have to do is uh, click this manual merge on the switch. When Whenever you hit the visible nodes, this is automatically going to switch over to all visible nodes. So just go back and you're good to go. And that is the easy object merge. So now let's go over the easy packed edit. And for this, I want to create some simulation geometry. So let's just use a pig head. And I'll actually go over this node here in a minute, I'm sure. Uh, but we'll just use the easy scatter drop just to quickly get a scattered kind of simulation, simulation going. So now that we have our little simulation, let's say we wanted to edit these packed primitives, but we didn't want to. We didn't want to have to resim this or do anything. We didn't want to edit it up here. We wanted to already have the simulation done, and we wanted to just edit it now. The problem with that is that these are packed in instance geometry, so we only have a single point per piece. So there's not really much we can actually edit here, and unpacking these is going to make uh, us lose all that optimization. It goes from 150 uh, points to 430,000. And to get it back into a state where we could uh, edit it here and then maintain and keep all that optimization is really kind of annoying uh, to set up and everything. So I made this easy packed edit node. And what it does, this rest frame here doesn't actually have to be the rest frame. By default, it's set to $f start, which is going to be the first frame in your sequence. I'll just turn that off and keep it at 1. And now we need to dive inside. So once we dive inside, it's going to isolate whatever instance is the very first instance. So now we have this instance, and we need to edit it now. So let's say I wanted to put a mountain on this, just to kind of deform it a little bit. Now, if we hop back out, you'll see that we have that mountain applied. 
Let me make it a little more drastic. You can see now that we have that amount applied, and the points are all still uh, packed, and we're not losing any type of optimization. You can also see that it stays throughout the simulation, or at least the mountain doesn't deform based off space or anything because we're using that rest frame. So the outputs here we have are the copy out, edited geo, which is what we're seeing right now. We have the rest packed geo, and we have the points from pieces. So if you wanted the points, we could grab those there. We could do the rest packed geo, which is just the uh, single piece that we're editing. And then we have the full thing that's packed still. Now these extra inputs here, these are for... Uh, I'll plug that in. Okay, so nothing crazy, but if we were to plug in packed pieces here, and then we were to plug in the uh, input that says rest proxy, which is going to be our proxy geometry just at rest, and then the rest high resolution proxy. So basically, this is going to be replacing low res little guys here with the high res version. And now we can jump in here and edit this big head still in any way we want. This is nice if say we wanted to just replace what's going on here. So and we could even go as far to just replace this guy with a squab. So now these are squabs. So that is how you use the easy packed edit. One thing to note though, is that the easy packed edit is only gonna work over one type of primitive at the moment. So I'm working on a solution where it'll work over multiple scattered stuff but uh, like for example if we had the squab and the pig head both merged into the same sim or something like that then whatever one we're going to be editing is going to be the uh, one that's applied to all of the points so it's going to basically overwrite everything with just one of them um, so it works definitely best when you're doing something uh, using just one G piece of geometry you could you could if you have a sim with a bunch of different stuff you could split up the geometry based off of maybe a path attribute or some sort of index or, or rest or something like that okay let's uh, move on to the next all right so now we have the easy quad remesh using labs and i had to put labs in the name because i really uh this is mostly their node um I don't think a lot of people know that this actually exists, which is part of the reason I made it, because uh, it definitely needs the word quad remesh in the name. There's actually this node called Instant Mesh, which is a quad remesher. Um, it's horribly named. I don't know why they called it that. But uh, this is basically that with some extra little uh, flair. So uh, by default, it's going to come in with half the target poly count. So I got the pig head, and then I'm. Um, uh, remeshing it with cubes and I can do half input do one fourth I can do two times input and this is going to take the amount of polygons that are on the input and uh, kind of try and match it based off of the scale and you can also just totally override all that and use the custom input here you can also do number of smooths do blurry iteration, which happens after, which is another thing that I added on top of this. And you can also transfer the attributes. So it's not bad. Uh, next, we're going to take a look at the easy RBD brush. One thing I found myself wanting to do in some of my work is if I have a let's say that I have something fractured and I don't really want to sim it I like I know what I want to do with it like I might want to scatter this let's say I want to scatter this on the ground okay cool so if I have this now and I plug this into the easy RBD brush I'm going to need to initialize it 
So I will hit initialize. And I'll reset all changes. There might be a little bit of just kind of offset from the beginning. Now you also can just pull in all visible geometry with the easy merge node. So you just hit collisions from visible geo. It's going to pull in that. And now you can see that we have our collision geometry. And now you just kind of start pulling away in the viewport. And I can start pulling this around. And let's say now I want, uh, let's say I want to add gravity now. And I kill all these guided sim uh, controls. And basically just start dropping these pieces and still kind of pull them around. Nice. And I mean, that's kind of the gist of it. There's some other controls in here for uh, con concavity. So like if, uh, for example, you're not getting enough uh, concavity out of this, you can start pulling some of this down. If you have a lot of concave uh, angles where like stuff is like going inwards like this, then you probably want to keep bringing this down a little bit. Uh, it's going to take a little bit longer, but you'll get a lot more accurate collisions. Same thing with the collision geo. There's also a mass concavity over here. Uh, it's by default set lower. Um, so to 0.1. And there, uh, there you go. That's pretty much the gist of it. Reset all changes is going to bring everything back to the original position. Uh, cook RBD is just going to encase. So the way this works is it runs basically a vellum brush on grains, and then it runs Python to cook and stash after each uh, mouse click and drag, and then refeed that into the vellum brush and reset all the uh, the applied edits. Hopefully that's not too confusing. Uh, so it does that, and then it runs the RBD sim. So if the RBD sim is looking weird or doing something, you can run, just click this cook RBD and it'll make sure that it refreshes it. It should automatically actually hit this button every single time you let go of your mouse. So uh, it shouldn't really be a big deal. But if you are having issues with it, it's there. All right. So there's that. And yeah, that's the Easy RBD brush. Let's keep moving on. So next is the Easy VDB remesher. And this is just a simple VDB remesher that uh, has set up to transfer attributes and sharpen edges and stuff. And it also uh, scales this down to basically a, a normalized scale before it does the remesh. So it should be pretty consistent. But uh, you have voxel size up here. And you can, if, for example, you're not getting sharp enough features, you could choose to sharpen the features here, which you might end up getting some artifacts, but uh, it'll help definitely keep the shape of whatever you're trying to pull in. And then you can uh, mess with this blurring or smoothing attribute as well. So it's pretty simple, but yeah, that's the gist of it. Let's move to the next one. So this is easy vellum brush. And for this one, I'm actually going to pull in a actual uh, piece of geometry just because it is going to show how this tool works better. All right, so this is a jacket that I got off of ArtStation and we're going to be using the easy vellum brush. Now, the main things that this is fixing is just kind of how vellum brush configures and sets stuff up by default. So if I were to drop a vellum configure cloth, and then a vellum brush in here. Okay, so now I try to start 
move some stuff around. You can see for one, it's taking a considerable chunk of time just to move something. And for two, I'm getting some weird stretching uh, on stuff. Also, if I was to move these buttons, you'll see we start getting stuff like this, where the button's flying off. And this doesn't really feel like how this jacket should... It doesn't feel like this jacket should stretch like this. The Easy Vellum brush uses kind of a low res proxy workflow. So if I plug this into the Easy Vellum brush, it's gonna run everything for us already. So it's just gotta let it do its thing. Okay, so you got this now. And this is the proxy geo. And this is really what we're gonna work with for most of the part. Uh, you can work on the final geo, but typically you really just wanna work with the proxy geo and then whenever you're ready to switch over, you uh, switch to this final geo. And now you'll see that uh, if I switch to drag, we can start kind of pulling this thing around how we would expect the jacket to actually move. And it, it just works a lot better because there aren't as many polygons and it's a consistent amount. So uh, Vellum doesn't think that it needs to stretch this as much. Okay, and so is that now whenever we're ready to switch back, we just uh, switch to the final. And now you see our buttons are all still in good position and our sleeves are all working good. Now something you might run into sometimes is if uh, the cloth capture is too small so like let's keep dragging this down so you might if, if it's too small you might get something like this and if you start seeing anything like this just go to the cloth resolution tab and start upping this cloth capture radius for small things uh, it's going to increase the amount of time uh, that it takes to capture this because basically the radius is telling it how many points are influencing each point. So like, if I move this point right here, the radius is essentially how far around that point uh, this point is gonna affect. And that has to run over every single point, so the bigger you make this, the more time it's gonna take to cook and evaluate. Also, if you aren't getting enough, let me just reset these changes. If you aren't getting enough detail in the like if you need more detail from this, uh, you can just up the target size, or I guess lower it. And that's gonna change the uh, resample resolution. So now we have this. So we have maybe a little more uh, stretching going on, but we definitely have more kind of wrinkles and little details. Okay. Then if we want collisions, we just plug them into this second input. Just put it there. Um, just because I don't really have, I don't really care enough to make an actual human mesh. So now I'm just gonna reset all changes and if I pull this down, sometimes uh, it might be a little bit, I think this actually started a little bit inside of it, but we're getting pretty good collisions here because we're using uh, VDB collisions. Now, if the collisions weren't uh, great, we could increase or decrease this resolution scale to get like a, a better a better collision object, I guess. All right, and then I just switch it back to final. And we'll let's go ahead and mix these together. And there we go. There's our shirt over our collision object. Okay, cool. So that's the easy vellum brush. So now we're gonna go over the easy scatter drop. And basically the idea behind this one is by so do I have that grid still? Yes I do. Let's take this grid and I'm gonna do Easy object merge. I just grab the visible nodes so I can grab the grid. And I'm going to put that as my collision geo. Turn off ground plane. Let's 
and I'll bring down the max concavity a little bit. That's fine. And now let's um just do something like let's just for example let's gather some pig heads. I'd probably do something more like a rock or uh I mean really you can do anything in this thing. But you know these guys in and all you gotta do is just plug those directly into the scatter drop and by default it's just gonna make a bunch of them um with these scatter points we can plug in custom scatter points if we want but for right now i'm gonna just use the default that it creates so i'll move these up a little bit actually Ooh. and let's scale this in a little bit And let's see, let's just jitter these a little bit maybe. And maybe make the point scale. But now I'm actually I actually am gonna use uh, custom scatter points, so let's take this and transform it up and scale it in. And I'll scatter points on this and we'll use those. So right now I'll just use 15 maybe. And what we want to do to use these is on this node, we'll go ahead and pull this scatter into the custom scatter. And I'm going to turn these guys off. And now, uh, basically, these enable random scale and enable transform and orientation, just kind of allow you to use this scale. Uh, it allows you to use uh, these transforms and stuff like that, and, uh, and you know, enable jitter and things like that, and just uh, so you don't have to set up all that stuff manually. You can set up min and max p scales. And okay, so uh, right now, if we just drop this, so we get, and we can go ahead and set simulation. Let's do 150 of these. And let's drop it now. We still get pretty good collisions. Now there's a few different little settings you could do here. Uh, one of them is if I bring this back to, I'll actually make this five this time. I'll reset the end emissions frame. So it's actually going to emit on every frame if we start cranking this up. We have it currently by default set to one, which is uh, just going to stop after the first frame. So if we set this to five, then see it emits for five frames. Let's do 15, or I guess 26, I guess. So now you'll see that it's going to keep emitting. For 26 frames. And this can be nice if you're, say, maybe you have a basket and you're trying to fill up, uh, fill it up with like pebbles or something, or I don't know. There's lots of little things you might want to use this for if you want to make a mound of something. Uh, there's plenty of different stuff you could do. Uh, you can also jump into this and you can use the solver, or uh, not solver. You can use pop forces. Also, now we're visualizing the collision geometry, which uh, we can make a little bit better if we go up here and start pulling down this collision concavity. If the collision, uh, I mean, if the geometry is super concave, like some of these squabs are, then that might help. I'm going to pull back. I'm just going to change this back to one. And now if we jump in, you can see that the collision geometry is a lot nicer. We can do stuff like... Uh, up a tract. Let's just put this to zero, zero, zero. And I'm sure I'll just use these settings. And I'll go five. And 
now you can see they're all clumping together. I'm actually going to go ahead and use maybe a sphere and a platonic, a few platonic meshes just to make this a little less, uh, a little more noticeable just because with the squab, it's just, <laughs> it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. So you now see that they're all kind of coming together. I'll do this for 20 frames. go. I'm going to do a pop axis force. And now they're all clumped together. You can do a lot of cool things with this. Um, Change some of the input geometry settings, uh, some of the force settings, the air resistance, gravity, number of sub steps, time, uh, time scale. Uh, I mean, like a, a lot of different things in here. So uh, that's pretty much the gist of this scatter drop, and they're all going to output um, all of these as packed primitives. So uh, yeah, that's the easy scatter drop. Let's take a look at the easy dynamic transform, and this is. I don't know how many of you guys have used uh, Solaris and or LOPS, uh, but they have a physics-based editing transform that you can use. Um, and I enjoyed that, and I wanted to make that at SOPS level. So I, uh, this node is essentially that. So let me just create some collision geometry for it. And all you do is you plug it in. And you need to click this initialize slash reset button. Once you do that, it's going to pull in the uh, initial geometry. And you also need to import collisions if you just want to import everything from the scene. But actually, real quick, first I'm going to make sure that this is not already colliding with stuff. All right, initialize, reset, import collisions. OK, so now. can just kind of move this around the scene. And then it can collide with stuff. So like if I wanted to hit the ground, just move this around. If I'm not getting enough uh, uh, concavity on the collision, I can bring this down. So I'll go 0 0.1. Just reset the sim actually. There you go. So now we're getting a lot cleaner, tighter uh, collision geometry. All right. And so um, that, I mean, that's the main gist of it. If you want a little bit higher resolution, we can do higher amount of sub steps. And it's not going to change a ton, but uh, it's just a real quick way to be able to move something around the scene and have it collide with stuff. So that's the easy dynamic transform. So next up, I have the easy seams from tubes. And this one is a, uh, a UV slash seam generator for kind of tube-like geometry like this that might be a, a bit difficult to UV properly because you want it to UV along the seam. So, I mean, along the tube. So if, I know I'm using a sweep for this, <laughs> which you can just generate the UVs from. But uh, if I, just had this geometry uh maybe I, I downloaded this geometry or something like that and it didn't come with uvs i would have to make them myself and if you want the texture to kind of feel like it follows the tube you need to still have uh you basically need to unwrap it along the tube as it goes and manually doing that can be really annoying if there's like 100 or 200 of these tubes so the idea here is to use these easy seams from tubes and um, it takes a camera. So if your uh, geometry is, if it's uh, still or anything like that, then you can use a camera to basically hide the seams behind the camera. And you can change something to, I think the easiest one is to use the lab skeleton curve here. It's gonna take a little bit longer, but it's uh, maybe a lot cleaner. You can see now. 
And now we can also click this generate UVs as well button. Now you'll see that we have uh, UVs kind of along the seams here. So you can do uh, change some of the methods here if you want. See if you get some better results. But uh, I think actually right out of the box, this didn't look very bad. Now on UV flatten, we can change between spectral or angle base. And uh, and yeah, I mean that's that's basically the gist of this easy seams from tubes. Along with this, um, really the main one is this easy UV seams, and I'll show you how we use that in a second. So I have this template body now, and it comes with UVs, so I'm actually going to delete them. Okay, so now we have no UVs, and if we plug this easy UV in, it wants a camera. We don't need a camera, but it wants one, so. Uh, to basically just turn this uh, camera and point it towards our camera that we're using. And then what we want to do, I'll turn UVs off for right now, uh, is we want to adjust this in-view threshold. You can see the higher we bring it up, the more kind of out of focus or covered up the seams get. And the lower we get, the kind of less aggressive it is with hiding those seams. So let's keep pushing this threshold up and I'll hop out of this view in one of these angles so I can see it from the side. Well, that's just UVM like this. So you can see now that it's pretty much eliminating anything that's cropped off like below his, uh, his waist here. Now we go with this threshold again the more covers up that seam. Okay, so this is using the camera plus the auto seams. So you can see the auto seams going up and down the middle and stuff like that. Uh, we have this auto seams uh, weight here. So we can mess with this guy. The lower we bring this down, the more impact it's gonna have on the uh, camera seams. If we do just the camera, you'll see these are our seams. And if we generate UVs like this, we're going to get a lot of stretching. So that's the whole kind of reason that we're using these camera auto seams. And we can kind of play around with these until we start to get a little bit more. We also, in the viewport, can go ahead and draw some seams. So, for example, there's a seam right there now. There is a seam right. Sometimes you have to give it a few goes. Go around his neck here. <laughs> this isn't the best uh, example, I guess, but you can see how you can get nice little UV patterns. If I turn off the seams and all that stuff, you can see that this is what our UVs are looking like right now. Um, then we can also go a step further and um, remove the distortion here. So we can remove UV distortion on, which is going to use the labs remove distortion setup. And there we go. We're getting some. I mean, we're, the seams are obviously in the way here, but uh, you can see how you can get some pretty quick UVs out of a camera view and some auto seams with this node. And that's, uh, that's the gist of the easy UV seams. So moving on, uh, we're going to look into the easy slow motion. Uh, so this node basically just causes some slow motion. So I'll create a camera here. If I look at the crag that's kind of walking. OK, so I drop down the easy slow motion node, and I just plug it in. And now what you have to do is you have to cache it. This actually isn't this isn't caching any of the geometry that's coming in. It's just caching a detail attribute. Um, so it's super quick to cache it, but that's why I recommend you cache entire sequence. <laughs> I guess we we should edit this speed first. Basically, the speed here controls how fast this thing is going to play. And we can actually animate this, which is the big deal for this node. So we can take this and say, I want when he swings it here, I'll put keyframe here. And then I'll take this down to 0 
and then uh, I don't really know. Let's let's see. Force recache. Let's keep playing through it. Right when it gets to maybe here, uh, another keyframe. I'll go forward a few, and then let's go back to one. And let's force recache entire sequence. Now we got this. So we got. Swing's about to start, then it goes into slow motion. And let's do another one right here. So let's go back a few, keyframe, go to 0 0.05 here, recache, change this to 500. Maybe I even start slowing it down more and more. And a little bit more and let's go right here i'll keyframe this and i'll go forward a few and then i'll put it back to one so now we got this slow motion slow motion again and hit and now there's a few different ways we can subdivide in between frames here. We can do a subdivision, which I prefer uh, the best. Sometimes you that might not be what you want, though. There's cubic and linear as well. Uh, you can choose to scale the velocities if there's velocity uh, on the point attributes. So you could basically scale them in between frames. And uh, by default, I have the volumes set to by voxel position. You can do this slow motion on volumes as well. Uh, it doesn't always work as well as it would here, but uh, you can get, you can evect volumes by a velocity, by vox position, or by grid index. Eh. <laughs> grid index or a transformation only. So I just have it set to by voxel position, which I think is the best. And um, that's really most of it that you need to know for this node. And uh, yeah. Do believe it still outputs this time warp attribute so we can see this time warp is just giving us basically a time attribute so at frame 24 or 25 i guess we'll have a value of one and then it's going to slow down with it so we can retime other stuff with this time warp attribute if we have to okay so moving on from that one let's take a look at the easy spiral Plug it in, and you'll see you start getting these spirals. The push is how far it gets pushed each frame. There's a smoothing and, and fit inside of this thing if we want to kind of remap some of it. Sub steps are important because each frame is going to vect itself. So the more sub steps, basically, the faster it's going to run. Maybe I give it a cross product of one. This is going to be the direction that it's going to be going in. So, I mean, it's 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 a fun little spiral node, but uh, it's nothing crazy. If we keep going forward, we have the easy box clip, which is similar to the camera clip, except it just uses a box. So um, it basically creates four clipping planes for you. So if I have a box here, and this is this is not a Boolean. Um, that I'm about to show you. This is a clip still. So basically it creates four clips. Um, so it's real easy to work on really heavy geometry. So let me just give this like a mountain. Stuff that maybe wouldn't work great for uh, Boolean stuff. You can just kind of pretty quickly clip out little squares. You can even change the angle of them. They don't have to be straight up and down. And you can box out stuff like that. So that's the easy box clip. Continuing on, we have the gradient spiral, which <laughs> the gradient spiral, which is different from the just standard easy spiral because it's not really a simulation, it just uh, is all at once. So I can do 
can be slice separation, something like that. You can get some kind of really cool looking uh, stuff going on here. All right, so that's the easy gradient. Now this next one, the easy fix intersecting pact is uh, a way to, you have a bunch of geometry that's, let's just scatter some points on a sphere. I'll do 50 and let's copy some pick heads to it. Okay, so I got these guys here and they're intersecting and I don't love it. And I kind of want, I want the same kind of look, but I don't want to deform any, like I don't want to push any of these things around, like deform the actual topology of it. I don't want to push things in. I just want to kind of almost like sim them out of where they are into a position where they would fit. So all you do is you plug them in. And then reset separation guide, reset RBD simulation. And you can see that uh, the separation iterations is basically how many frames this thing's gonna run. Uh, but it's taking it from a rest point to a position where they all are de-intersected. So there you go. And now you got the kind of same look you got here, but uh, de-intersected pick heads. So moving on from that, we have the easy sculpt, which uh, is kind of like a, it's not for uh, super realistic or super heavy models. It's basically kind of like for a, for a rough outline of something before you want to start adding the details. It's, it's kind of like, I don't know how many of you use ZBrush, but uh, it's basically dyna meshing. So if I check on the DynaMesh, and I can start painting things, and with each stroke, it's going to re-DynaMesh the object. And I can change these DynaMesh settings. Maybe I up the smoothing. And it's just a quick way to uh, get a rough shape of something. And then if you want to take it further from here, this is obviously terrible. But, uh, but yeah, that's the idea behind this. You can change the voxel size if you want to make it a little bit higher res here. You can change, obviously, all the same controls that you get with, uh, with the brush. If you want to sharpen the features so you don't lose as much of the like edges and stuff, you can check that on and play with this uh, tolerance here. But, uh, yeah, that's the gist of this one. Uh, I think the last one here is going to be the easy knife, which is a fun one. It's essentially a clipping plane. So you have to initialize and reset. And then when you click and drag, you're going to get a plane. Now, on whatever side is red is what's going to get clipped off. And whatever side is blue is going to get, uh, is going to stay. You can flip the axis here by just holding control. And whenever you let go, it's going to apply this cut. So I'm going to cut off his nose. And then I'm going to cut off his ears. And then maybe... So yeah, I mean, there's... um Basically, in, in this, you can control... If you want it to polyfill, if you don't want it to actually polyfill, you can uncheck that and then it'll start just cutting uh, straight through. Now, one thing to note is that uh, currently this actually doesn't work with any undos. You can't undo it. The only way you can um, remove what you've done is to basically start over. So be very cautious about that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to work to fix that. But uh, at the moment, that's sadly the only way uh, to go backwards okay so that's the easy knife and lastly we have the easy interactive boolean so if i check this on and uh if 
by default, it's going to be blank. You have to hit this initialize uh, slash reset. And now if I hit enter and I'm in the view state, I can just start uh, dragging out shapes. So there is a bunch of shapes that come with this um, by default. You can actually add your own if you plug something into the second input. But for right now, I'm just going to show you the default shapes. First, we have a square. And if you drag out and let go, by default, it's going to drop down the geometry. Now, if you hold control while you're dragging and then you let go with control still held, it's going to cut. So you can make cuts and you can make uh, added pieces. And now if for whatever reason you want more geometry to work with or you want to kind of smooth this out and stuff, um, you can dynamesh this by just clicking the middle mouse button. And now you see we have a dynamesh of this. Now, when you're dragging shapes out, if you're dragging out and you start scrolling on the mouse wheel, you can scroll through some of the input geometry. So if I want to use this sphere now, I can do that. Maybe I want this triangle. And let's go ahead, let's, let's plug a pig head into this. So plug that in there. And then now we can see that we can cut our, add our pig head in. If I want to reset everything, I can just initialize and reset. If I right click, you can see we have snapping options. So there is scale step snapping and there's rotation step snapping. I'm going to use the rotation step snapping. So now I can very easily snap the rotation of this pig head around. So now it's facing perfectly straight down. One other thing we can do is we can do on um, these uh, match size over here. They're also up here. We can do uh, justifies. So we can justify in the center of X. So it's going to be in the middle here. And let's also justify in the center of Z. And now we should be able to be exactly in the middle here. So let's initialize and reset. And I'm going to use a cube for this. I keep using cubes. You can see now that these cubes are perfectly placed in the center. And if we wanted to, say, uh, do it on this side, we could just set it to x and y. So center, x, center, y. All right. And then one thing to note is, like the uh, easy knife, this tool does not uh, do undos. However, there's a little bit of a way around it I made. Uh, at the moment, I'm going to eventually get around to making it uh, legitimate. But uh, we have this load, last edit, and load backup. So it does save one, uh, uh, your last edit, basically. So if I go on this. Oh, yeah, I forgot I'm centered. And I drag this out. And I hit load, last edit, and I hit initialize, reset. It's going to pull back the last edit. Uh, you have to have this checked on with the initialize reset. You also can save backup files. So you can, for example, say, I got that, and I want to save backup file. And now I initialize reset, and I want my backup file back. Even if I do a bunch of stuff here, I can do load backup file, and initialize reset, and it's going to bring it back. Okay, so last thing um, is just some of the side features. So if I drop something and then I do right click, you can choose to not align surface normals if you don't want to uh, have everything aligned. So I could uh, keep drawing here. And it's not going to align to the surface normal anymore. You can also go ahead and do copy previous scale. It's going to whatever scale of your last object was. It's going to use that. So you can see how these are all the same scale now. You don't have to resize anything perfectly. And again, to Dynamesh, just middle mouse button click. You can change those Dynamesh settings with this VDB Dynamesh settings tab here.
All right. And that sums up the easy interactive Boolean. All right, so in this uh, tutorial, I'm going to be going over how to use this easy kit bash collect tool I have here and why you might want to use that. So um, if I hop into Modeler, I made this tool specifically for Modeler. However, uh, it really should work just fine with any um, Houdini uh, kit bash plugin. And it's really just a way of collecting a lot of, of stuff. So let's say I have, um, if I go into some of my folders, give me one second. Okay, so if I go into uh, uh, some of my folders, I have this uh, test. Um, I just copy over some of my 3D files that I own um, into here. And so I have a bunch of different stuff in here. I have some buildings, some CG access. I have uh, some base meshes that I got off of uh, Fart Station and, and uh, Gumroad and stuff. And I have some, some mushrooms. I have Penguin. I have, I have lots of different stuff in here. Um, let's say that I want to get everything that's inside of all of these folders into here. And I don't want to have to go through each folder. Because I have, in my actual 3D objects folders, I have a lot of content that I've bought over the years. Um, so merging all that in by hand is incredibly slow if, I, if I'm going to use the default method, which by default, if I wanted to add something in here, let's, let's say I want to add something to this mushrooms tab. Uh, I go, I'll drop pighead, and I'll go add geometry. And that's, that's fine and fast and awesome, but having to import everything from this folder into uh, Houdini and then dra uh, drag it in and then do, do this for every single one is just a pain. Um, so if I delete this, I'm gonna create a new library here. Or hell, I don't even have to do that actually. So if I go into this kit bash collect and in here, it asks for a search directory, what it wants me to search for, and then you have some test geometry options uh, here. So I'm just going to go into here. Well, I'll actually, I'll go find it. So I'll go search directory. I know it's in my B folder. It's in 3D. And it's test. So this is my search directory. I want to search for anything that has a OBJ input. And just to test, uh, test this, I'm going to go find something. I'll go. Uh, I actually don't know how many things in here are even OBJ models. There's, there's one. Okay, so here's a manhole cover. Um, typically, the stuff that uh, you get from other sites is scaled wrong because Houdini scale is different than uh, a lot of other softwares. So there's this transform scale option. Uh, you have a match size option. If you want to make sure that everything's centered and a, a uniform scale, do that. Um, there's also a dive network custom operation, which allows you, if you double click, you can, um, do whatever you want in here and it'll get applied to everything that gets output. So let's say I want to rotate this 90 degrees. This is just a test visualization. This, this doesn't really have anything to do with anything. Um, I actually think I made that, uh, priority, which I'll, I'll change before I ship this out. Um, so you don't have to actually put anything there if you don't want. Uh, but at the moment, uh, that's a necessity. And I'm just going to switch this to transform. And now we need an output directory. And now for modeler, wherever you have your kit bash directory is the kit bash directory for this thing. So here I'm going to go uh, Houdini 18.5 because that's where my kit bash is. And I'll create a new folder called uh, kit bash collection example and then you'll actually see that pop up on the left side of my screen somewhere kit bash collection example it's empty right now so i'll hit accept this is where i want to save things and all i gotta do is cook output node and it's gonna take a minute if i allow editing i can actually jump in and you can kind of watch this thing work so at the moment, it's just, um, it already found all the files. 
and now it's just invoking the uh, our transform operations that that we applied to it. So once it gets done with these, you'll start seeing. If I go to that file location on my actual desktop, so go Houdini 18.5, go Modeler, Kitbash, Kitbash Collection Example. Might have to wait for a minute. All right, and so uh, it took a minute to actually start, and then it actually did basically all of them at once. But now if we look in here, we have all of our geometry moved into Kitbash Collect and saved out as BGEOs. Uh, so all we have to do now is if I turn this off, for, for, for Modeler, if you want little icons, um, all you have to do is go update all icons. And if you have a lot of stuff, which I've actually done this for massive imports of my whole 3D library, uh, which was thousands of of objects, uh, this is going to take a minute, and it also is going to be very flashy, so uh, you've been warned, but uh, if I hit OK, of, of course, uh, <laughs> here, one second, okay, I'm booted back up, that caused a segment fault, but um, there's no worry, all those files are actually moved on your actual computer, so uh, it really doesn't matter if I had to boot this up, I still have all this stuff in here. You don't see anything because they don't have icons. Now, if I go update all icons now, you will start to see. Here, give it one more try. Update, let's do. Maybe I need to do update new icons. Here, I'll reload modeler. And I'll go update new icons. There we go. So now you'll see it's starting to go through everything that we made, and it's making icons for them. And this could take a minute. I don't know what I put in that folder, honestly. But here you go. And now you have everything from that folder in here. Unfortunately, they do not come with the, uh, they, they do not come with the, textures and, and all that stuff that comes with it. That's just a side effect of uh, this setup in general. So honestly, it works best for things that you can shade procedurally. However, you can uh, create a workflow uh, kind of around this. But uh, as stands, to be able to go through a whole folder and collect everything and move it to another location is what this tool is for. I hope this was useful. Um, we'll move on to the other Kitbash collection tool I have in a second. All right, moving on. Uh, this tool uh, is for situations like this. If I have, let me, let me make sure that this is the right file. Okay, so sometimes in Kitbashes, you get stuff like this, where uh, for example, I bought this robot kitbash on our station, and there's there's 250 pieces in this thing, but they all came in one file. Like they, this is this is all that I got. So it's not like they're already cached out into individual files. It's just this, and doing this manually sucks. Uh, which is what I was doing for a, a minute, and then it just is too much. Uh, so if I do for each connected piece. You can kind of browse through these just to understand what I'm talking about a little bit better. I'm also going to do single pass. So you can see I have all these different items that are kind of their own thing. And I want them all separated out so I can do the same kind of thing I just did with this kit bash in uh, Modeler. So... What I can do for this is I can do my uh, kit bash collect into separate uh, files or separate pieces. And what all I have to do here is I just have to import 
whatever um this guy is. Oh, I actually think I had it already set there. And now um by default, I believe it's actually running through a for each loop that's hooked up to your frames. So I can browse through these if I want to see the different pieces. And um I can separate these with a few different things. So I can also check this on and off. I'll check this off right now. Um, I can do custom attribute. I can do connectivity, which is what I was doing. This That's probably not best for everything. A lot of the time in a kit bash situation like this, you'll get some sort of, like if I go back here and I take a look at uh, this name attribute, that is probably very often that's going to be what defines the pieces. And see, we have a bunch of different name attributes here. And then you can also use a shop material path or whatever. That's why there's the custom attribute. But if you don't have that, you can use the connectivity, which will just spit out connected pieces. And then um, just like in the other one, we have this ability to transform these scales. And we also have the ability to match size. Um, we also have the ability in here to make any changes that we want to apply to the output. You can unpack them. Um, we also have this ability to use the FBX import if we want to use the scaling. Um, sometimes there's different stuff that happens with that. Uh, that only applies for .fbx files. You can match size, do whatever you want there, and then all we have to do is find a output for this thing. So I'm going to put this in, if I go into modeler kit bash folder, and I go new output, and I go OK. Then I'll save to disk. And you'll see that it just wrote all of those files. And I believe it wrote them here. And now I can update all icons here. And you'll see, it's gonna take a minute, but we should get um, all of our pieces from this kit bash file now moved into this location that we can easily drag and drop with the modeler kit bash tool. Any day now. Uh, yes, like I said, for massive files, this might take a minute. It's pretty fun to watch sometimes, but uh, let's kind of just, I can start uh, dragging these in now. If I go to modeler, I can start just kit bashing away. I mean, that's this is obviously terrible, but it's like you, you get the point of how it can be really nice to just automatically cl collect stuff like this. And you can use it for other purposes, but that is the main reason I built this tool. So I hope this helps um, kind of understand how these work. And if you have any questions, leave me a comment.